isn't Rio de Janeiro. It isn't City of God. It isn't Mumbai. It isn't Slumdog Millionaire. It's the biggest slum in Africa. Kibera slum in Nairobi, Kenya. Slumdog Millionaire, City of God, two global hit films about kids and slums. Here in Kibera, they've even made their own, about kids, gangs and music. By 2050, one in three people could be living in slums, three billion slum dwellers, 600 million of them children. So far in early life, we've seen how the first five years of a child's development can be crucial. So is Kaibera seizing the opportunity. In our film, we put together a typical day in the lives of four children under five. From daybreak, sub-Saharan Africa's biggest slum is noisy, chaotic and unhealthy. There's violence, robberies, carjackings, vigilantes. On some days, murder victims left on display. There are no proper drains and no rubbish collection. There are stinking latrines and open sewers. Malaria and typhoid are common. The death rate for under fives here is three times Nairobi's as a whole. So far, four-year-old Nazaru's survived. Nazaru and his cousin Maria go to a preschool run by the church. There are no Kenyan government ones. Preschool gives Nazaru's mum time to work. It feeds him and keeps him away from urban stress and unpleasant strangers. A new concern after the post-election violence in 2007. It's no good for children because, because if you look at this place, where we live, there are drunkards who just come and start talking dirty. And as they talk, the children are listening. But it's not just the danger of harm or moral corruption. Stress can raise levels of the hormone cortisol, permanently altering the brain's architecture. The result can be kids with a dangerously short fuse. We have a growing science space that tells us that among the many things that children learn early in their life is a sense of safety and a sense of threat. And we know that children who are in unstable or in threatening situations um, develop adaptive mechanisms to cope with that. And um, one of the more interesting things that's been uh, illustrated by this work is the extent to which children who live in violent, threatening environments um, overinterpret threat in circumstances that other children as they're growing up might see as neutral. And this is, this is adaptive. If you live in a violent, threatening environment, it is good for you to kind of have a short fuse. Preschool is a safe space for the kids, somewhere they can develop peacefully and in theory become less violent adults. But many parents can't afford the $10 a month fees. Nazaru's mum can only afford five so she's constantly in arrears. How are you? Uh, the sun is there. The sun is there. But preschool isn't just about avoiding stress. It's also about stimulating young brains when they're developing most rapidly. Interaction with caring adults is essential for healthy development. Interaction helps build the circuitry of the brain right through the early years.
There are some kids in Kaibira who aren't lucky enough to go to preschool. Both Natasha's parents have died, and her uncle can't afford to send her to preschool regularly. So at four, Natasha has been in and out of preschool. Natasha spends most of the day hanging around the neighborhood. She's locked out. Her uncle doesn't trust her alone in the house. She spends her day killing time, waiting for friends to return from school. I think there's millions of Natashas around the world. The majority of children who are poor in developing countries are like Natasha. The, the staying at home and doing, or working maybe, or doing n nothing constructive in terms of their development is, is the norm, I would say. And the danger of that is? Well, they won't develop to their full potential in, in language and in cognitive development and in social skills, and they will be overwhelmed when they get to school. This morning, in Nazaru's class, it's a rubber band that provides a quick lesson in social skills. It's going to be a face-off, but Nazaru's classmate Brian decides not to get involved. Half a kilometre away, at Star A's preschool, young teacher Madahana starts morning art class. Patience joined a few months ago, and it's her first chance to play with colours. Go and sit over there. Sit over there. Preschool isn't just about social skills. It's about creativity, too. Teacher, can I have another block? Experts disagree over how critical the first five years are and over whether more funding should be diverted to early childhood development. But many of those who set the agenda for global development now regard early childhood as a key priority. The child, of course, comes into the world with many gifts, but they need to be developed. Uh, the synapses in the brain need to be developed. The feelings need to be developed. The ability to have social contact needs to be developed. The creative elements need to be developed. The language needs to be developed. And you can't leave it till five or six years old. Uh, this all happens much earlier. And all the evidence suggests that those children that have this stimulation on all those areas and, and combined with that health and proper nutrition to make sure that they develop appropriately, that those kids over lifetime will do better than other children. Overstressed, understimulated, kids like Natasha face a more uncertain future. Even if they do get to primary school, it's hard to recover from a poor start. What can lie in wait? Petty crime, violence, unwanted teenage pregnancy. Where's your uncle? He's gone to the lake. What is he doing? He's gone to get fish. When does he come back? At eight. When? At eight in the evening. I can't play a drum, drum, drum. I can't play a drum. What can you do? Preschool beats hanging around? Sounds obvious. Problem is, what kind of preschool? Some African traditions can conflict 
with Western ideals. You find that in our African community, children are not allowed to speak when elder people are speaking. They just have to remain silent, and which is conflict with their freedom of expression. You find that children learn, they get more confident when they express themselves, they express their ideas, and when you ban them, you keep on telling them, shut up, shut up, the child stops thinking. But some experts fear Western-style preschooling can ignore African definitions of intelligence. This game is about feeding my family. Take this! Me, me, me! Unlike in the West, where children are involved in nonsense play, African children actually, when they play, they are doing livelihood tasks. The, 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 their play is around things that sustain the f life of families. So, and I refer to that as um, responsible intelligence. Some critics say that the Western model pushes children towards creative individualism and personal ambition, walking alone through the world. The African model, it's said, encourages children to learn from each other and develop social skills. Not that patience sees it that way. Why do you like this thin game? Because I like jumping on the railway track when I go home. The child-to-child -child relationship and interaction and le uh, peer, peer mentoring right from an early age is very important and very helpful. It is really there in the sense that children are concerned about not leaving others behind. Okay, so they are very helpful. So in an African setting, that plays out in the sense that from, early, from an early age, parents monitor and ensure that their children are helpful and such that even if a child is excelling in, in, school, in school learning, parents are concerned if that child is not socially smart. With state primary schools now free, the Kenyan education budget is fully stretched. So here in Kibera, preschools are organized by the church, community groups, and by parents. Classes can be big. Brian and Nazaru have 54 classmates. And enrollments are up. After the election violence, parents think twice before leaving kids with neighbors. Preschool is more valued than ever, not just for food, but for security. Brian's mother came to Kaibera from Western Kenya. She hoped for a better life, but now can't afford to send her other kids to preschool. So she's worried Brian's younger brother, Fidel, could take lessons not from teachers, but from strangers. Most children are bad mannered because children in Kibera hang around areas where there are drunks or thieves. Sometimes the children hear bad stories from these people who don't go to work and are influenced by them. I sit down with my children. I try to tell them not to do the bad things, like, if you go to steal, you will be lynched. 
If you drink alcohol, the police will detain you for life and I will never see you again. Warning them like this scares them. When she's working, Brian's mother trusts her 16-year-old niece Lydia to look after Fidel and his baby brother Elvis. Back in class, five hours under a hot tin roof, ends with a sleep on a dirt floor. <laughs> but what about the rest of the day? Can early childhood development happen outside preschool too? Even while leaving, there's still a chance to help young minds develop. Nazaru still learning the social skills. Time to go home. But does home help or hinder early child development? Patience's mother washes clothes for a living. She's taken the afternoon off to help with homework. L M N O P Q R. Patience's mother has a practical take on the difference preschool has made. Tafauti inyenaona. Patience has really changed with preschool. Now, if I call her when she's far away, she will come running. I can also send her to the shops. And she goes running. When I'm sick in bed, I can send her to go buy me some medicine. And she'll run and fetch it. But no such stimulation for Natasha or the baby she's looking after. <laughs> Breaking news updates on your mobile phone. Nazaru's back home already. It's about to get busy for his mother. Potatoes need to be fried and sold. And since going to preschool, Nazaru has been helping out more. I do help carry. I carry. What do you carry? Hmm? If I'm asked, I carry chapati. We need a sema, nasurongo, and a kwangala change tangia, a kiwam dog. Before I took him to school, he was stubborn. But now he's going to school. He's changing. I used to ask Nasul to stop doing something. But he used to tell me to stop stressing him out because he's still a child. <laughs> Patience also enjoys helping her mother out. Mom, we need a bowl for the veg and one for the stems. If she finds onions on the table, she wants to slice. If I'm not near, 
I worry she might cut herself. So I give her a blunt knife so that she can learn how to cut and be contented that she has helped her mother. At least are you cooking? I'm preparing the veg but not cooking. Who will then? My mother will. It's an everyday task, but some experts say it is still cognitive stimulation, stimulating kids to think. And they say learning at home the African way should not be overlooked in the rush for preschool. Most African parents do, would not answer directly, mother, father, how did you do that? And the, the typical response would be, don't you have eyes? And it is translated into, you are expected to watch, to observe, see what I do and know it and not ask me. It's not for me to teach you. So, and I think that is far more cognitive uh, stimulation where the child is figuring out things and not being prodded. It's not being pushed or to do, to instructed. Back in Brian's school, the older kids are still at it. Now, creative drawing. Volunteer teacher Sarah is concerned about traditional ways. In the West, we're very much taught to think for ourselves, um, even question authority, you know, just all of that individual thinking. And here, you do everything as a group, um, even in the classroom. And so it is very hard for people to do, or for the children to do something on their own. Oftentimes, um, even some of the students, if they're sitting near each other, they'll all draw the same thing. It's Patience's fourth birthday. The push for early childhood development came from the West. So is the West imposing its own model? of how kids should grow up. Well, this is a common criticism uh, that we, uh, the West are imposing um, practices on Africa that aren't appropriate. And to some extent, it may be true. But if you speak to the, to the parents and ask them what they want for their child, you will be amazed that they want their children to be doctors, teachers, nurses. They are very ambitious for their children. and. And if, as soon as they understand that the children are not going to have a better life than they're having, which is what most parents want, unless they do something about their early child development, um, things aren't going to improve. Next year will be Patience's first year at primary school. She could grow up to be, well, anything really. If you give the kids better stimulation in those early years, they will do better in their primary, secondary and tertiary years. They will stay in school. The evidence is overwhelming that if you give them better stimulation in the early years and health and education and, and nutrition, that if you can get to the kids in those years, then your task in primary, secondary and tertiary is much better. And so it is not a waste of money, it is, it's an investment. Early childhood development may seem unaffordable to poor countries and to poor parents, but risks can be worth taking. When I look at my own life, I, I see that because I'm the son of illiterate, starkly illiterate, illiterate parents, but who pushed me go, go go into the world. And they gave that opportunity and they knew they feared, they didn't fear anything. I mean, I think the, the essential thing is to dare and to dare responsibly. <laughs> Natasha's uncle hopes she can go to preschool too soon. He's already bought her a uniform. It's been estimated there are 200 million children like Natasha in the world. Many may not recover from a poor start. But for Natasha, at least, there is still hope.